whenever someone introduces me like that, I'm glad that Margie's in the room so she can, <laughs> so she can hear just how amazing I, <laughs> I really am. So, and this time we got it on tape, so that's even better. Well, um, so I'm Mike Ferreter, and this is uh, Margie. We've been married over 37 years, and uh, two Saturdays ago was our 40th anniversary of our first date, and so we celebrated that. And then from here, we're gonna actually head down to Carmel, California, where my son, Michael Patrick, our little Irishman, Patty Ferreter, uh, is at the Navy Postgraduate School, and we'll promote him to major and spend a wonderful uh, weekend, extended weekend, in what we consider to be our hometown, other than probably Tacoma and, and Stellacom and Lakewood, um, where, we, where we are now. Um, and uh, where we were married in, uh, uh, back in 1979. Um, I was commissioned out of the Citadel, just to give a kind of frame in here, uh, which is a, a great school in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, served as an infantryman, a paratrooper, an army ranger, special operator for uh, about, you know, for the best part of my career. For the first 18 years, I never left troops. I never left an infantry battalion until I was a full colonel. And that, that's uh, unheard of. That sort of gives me, gave me a lot of insights on, on uh, really where the rubber meets the road, where action occurs, and where, if you have a good concept of operation and well-trained people, they can do almost anything. Especially if, um, if you provide um, positive, uh, leadership and a positive role model to them. Through no fault of my own, the Army kept promoting me, and uh, I just tried to be nice to people and, uh, and take care of people. And, uh, and so I found myself in the latter parts of my career in the corporate side of the United States Army or in the corporate side of, of a $143 billion you know, multinational, multi-enterprise business. Uh, I ended up... Uh, commanding all the army bases around the world in a command that's called Installation Management Command, where we had 75 army bases in 17 time zones um, with 73,000 employees. Uh, with, we provided uh, at any, we were a city. Each army base, JBLM is a, and McCord is a city. And there are 300 services provided there, ranging from front gate security, roads and works, public works, renewable energy, uh, 283 child development centers around the world. There's uh, uh, 400 fitness facilities, uh, barracks for, hey Joe, I just, my eyes are just good enough to recognize you now. Um, uh, you know, barracks for about it, uh, 250,000 people. We had 86,000 individual homes, houses, we call on-base housing or quarters. Um, and, um, and then we had all the morale, welfare, and recreation, 55 golf courses that I felt it was really important for me to inspect each one <laughs> because the soldiers deserve no less. But that's right. So, so the bottom line was, and then uh, we had a $12 billion a year budget. And so it was so big and so unwieldy that people would say, you can't really lead an organization like that. And I think you can. I think, and when they ask me, how did you do it? How did you take a $12 billion budget and save $3 billion in two years? That's what we did. We cut the budget by $3 billion in the federal sector where they say you can't do anything. And um, so about 8,000 of my employees um, left and not one was fired or released without uh, what we call a reduction in force. So we, we trained them, we gave them new skills, we sent them to college and schools, we found placement for them, or we gave them uh, an incentive for retiring early. And, uh, and w in doing so, we went from the gray beards on the civilian base to fuzzy beards, and hiring uh, youngsters who are totally fired up. So what I found was, uh, when I now uh, go around and tell everyone I was a three-star general, they say, that's great, thanks for your service. And then when I say, you know, I jumped out of airplanes more than 200 times and deployed to combat in Mogadishu, Somalia, and to Baghdad three times, they go, wow, thanks for your service. And I led soldiers all over the world at the pointy end of the spear, thanks. And then when I say, I ran a worldwide multinational, you know, multi-compo, $12 billion a year, Fortune 500 company, then people start saying, well, come talk to us about business. <laughs> and so that's why I'm here. Now, Margie and I started the Ferreter Group 
and our idea is to change America to inspire leadership. And it sounds really good and it's really lofty. And today I'm gonna to talk about how I see or visualize using inspired leadership to uh, lead your workforce, uh, to lead a workforce. And so for everyone in here who are gonna start companies or uh, have started companies, um, I would start with just really simple. And what I wanna do um, with everyone's uh, you know, acknowledgement and approval is, I'm just gonna kinda go through this. You can stop me at any time and ask a question, but I'm gonna not try to tell as many war stories as I normally do. And I'm gonna try to get through really what I think is how you demonstrate inspired leadership. So you can come back and from your seat say, well, how would I do it if I'm running this kind of business or I have this kind of situation and all that. So that's, that's the, a start point. So um, demonstrate inspired leadership. When people ask me how is that or what is that, then um, I say it's pretty simple. And one time my son, Patty, who were about to promote, told me he was about to take over a rifle company and he wrote his command philosophy and it was four pages long. And I said, Patty, no one is gonna read four pages, okay? It's gotta be something that everyone just kinda knows who, who you are. So, so I, I begin with um, do what's right. And so for every company and for every person, if you start off with what your values are, then all your decisions become easy decisions in life. And so we, we put on leadership seminars now where we focus on respect and character and the courage to follow through. Respect each other, respect yourself, respect the space around you. Have the character, the decision, and the values of what's important to you. So if I said, uh, you know, hoppy beer or light beer, raise your hand. Hoppy beer, light beer, ale, Budweiser, wine. Okay, so we kind of made it, you know, Seahawks, Denver, Seahawks, Denver, right? Not a lot. So we make those decisions, but at the front of our business life, we should make the decisions on, you know, honesty, integrity, teamwork, you know, those values that every single day, you're not, they're not negotiable. There's a lot of negotiating in business, but not uh, your values. Frances Hesselbein is this 99 or so year old woman who's no taller than this, and she's been a leadership guru uh, with the Peter Drucker uh, Foundation, among others. And, uh, and she's been a mentor to all the four-star generals for the last 25 years or so, and I was fortunate to meet her. And she told me, leadership is who you are, and management is what you do. And so if we're gonna demonstrate inspired leadership, then we start right with who we are. And so first is, is do what's right. And so in all cases, whether it's dealing with customers or partners or colleagues, if they know that you're a man or woman of character and your yes is yes and your no is no, I believe more opportunities will fall your way and more success will fall your way. And, and to get you know, the acronym team, together everyone accomplishes more. Together everyone accomplishes more. So you, you have to be willing to say, this is exactly what I stand for, or no. I could make a little more money, but I'm not gonna do that because that's not what I'm about and that's not what we're about. The second, so these are the six pillars I gave my son Patty in this, this uh, semi-war story here. The second is do your best. Don't try to be the best. Just do your best. Do your best, right? And so in that case, um, as you're developing your teams underneath you, you're, you've, you've given them two get out of jail cards already. You know, one is, hey, I had to make a tough decision. You know, one of the guys called me, I, you know, we were negotiating this kind of speaking engagement thing and I kind of went with that. Fine, that's good. I, I want you to be comfortable representing yourself and representing this company. Um, so trying to be the best leads to unhealthy competition. And, and uh, you know, every time two near peers compete, the third competitor wins every single time as you take each other down, as you corner on more of the pie rather than making the pie bigger, someone else is gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna slide in on you. So don't try to be the best, but be your best, which leads um, really to improve daily. Uh, and so um, when, uh, when I talk about improving daily, it's also about having a great balanced life. So improve your relationship you know, with your faith. Improve your relationship with your family. 
Improve your relationship with your friends. Improve your relationship in business with your partners and customers, and then improve your relationship with yourself. And so get rest, eat good food, um, do things in moderation, and do PT twice a day, right? <laughs> I knew I was going to say that. <laughs> and so if that's the case, then you can, do, you can do almost anything. You know, I was asked to rewrite the Army's Combatives Manual one day in uh, 1999, and so we did that. I've got the team together, and we wrote the hand-to-hand -hand fighting manual, uh, rewrote it. And so this little second baseman and basketball player became a grappler. And in order to be a good leader, I thought I should probably do this two or three times a week so that the soldiers would see that this, at that point, colonel is on the match rolling around. And after 17 years, this first prop is, you know, it's impossible to get a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu unless you just, you know, eat that elephant one bite at a time, keep, keep steady progress. And so if your company's small, um, remain patient, move it forward, make steady progress. So as you improve, I would tell anyone in here, uh, Tom, uh, if they don't have a concept for how they deliver their service or product, then they have hope. And, uh, and so the most important thing is, is to develop a process that's repeatable and that your team underneath you can, can carry on. If, if you're not there for four weeks, that they understand it. And uh, all the time I, when I talk to folks, they, they know what they want, but they haven't really just walked the simple dance steps. So what the Ferreter Group does is, is we help a lot of people. Um, our goal is to change America through inspired leadership, but not my inspired leadership, his inspired leadership and his inspired leadership. And so if we infuse th this idea that you have here of veterans making a difference, everywhere a veteran shows up, that company got better that day. Every time you build a team, that whole neighborhood got better. Every time you move into a community, their high schools got better, their neighborhoods, their community, the businesses around your business. And so improving daily with a concept of how you deliver the service is what will allow you to keep going and to keep growing. Um, what these hats represent is, is uh, victory, okay? So have fun as well. And so uh, each time that the Ferreter Group kind of closes a deal with someone, when I'm leaving the airport, I buy a hat. And then I put it on and I take a selfie picture and then my kids go, oh, dad, way to go. <laughs> and the company guys, you know, guys in the company go, all right. And so, um, so on each one of these presenting, working with them, most, most of these are veteran owned companies. And our aim is to get their product placed in AFES, in uh, MWR, in Whole Foods and whatever, whatever they want is to find a way to help them and to move it forward. Now, sometimes you have to remind them that they, they, they don't compete against each other. You know, and, they'll, and they'll say, hey, will you sign a non-compete on this? And I'll say, no, I'm, you know, I'm just here to help. I'm not going to run a, a yogurt company, so don't worry about it. Um, but each one of these, so I went to Dallas the day before yesterday in a meeting that will allow these guys to have even more success. And, and so I got the uh, picture, posted it, and all my Seahawk friends said, Sir, that's unsat. Don't <laughs> you can't do that. Um, so build teams and take care of the little guys. The next step, and so uh, you, you should wake up every single day. And I think in the business world, I'm finding that it's not just a team underneath you, but it's actually the team of people that you do business with. And ask every day who in that team needs to be. Who should I talk to today? Who's the one that's right at the limit of, you know, uh, the relationship? And let me just reel them back in. And so, or if you have employees, then who's the one that you thank? You, as a boss, you can't say thank you too many times in a day. Reach out, write a note, give a phone call, send an email, say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because they do things, your, your workforce and your friends and your partners will do things on your behalf that you'll never even know about. You'll never be able to get to them and, and see what they did and thank them on the spot. So have an attitude towards thanking them. Um, the next is never quit. And so um, 
I start with this. This is a deck of cards, okay? These are the number of rooms that I've stayed in since I, re <laughs> since I retired, all right? And so it's helpful that I'm retired and I have a retirement paycheck. So I understand that not everybody, not every young sergeant can stay in a hotel room over and over again. But it's a metaphor for how many times you have to approach the subject of your deal, the person of your deal, the influencer of the person of your deal, right? Never quit. So it, I read something somewhere that said, it, the average person when they're promoting, and if you're running a business, you're, you're also the director of sales and you're director of marketing, and you're, you're, uh, you're probably everything but director of finance, and that's Miss Margie. So, so she's, the, she's the CFO, but um, so you have to normally six visits to get success. And so each time you sit down, as part of your plan is this is the first cup of tea. What do I want out of this? The beginning of a relationship. In the end, what do I want? A relationship for life, which means we don't burn bridges because they might not be able to accommodate what you're asking, like we're, we're gonna set that up for to take care of those guys so, or reintegrating sort of thing. And so you're, you're gonna get a lot of no's, right? Before you get the yeses. It's the yes that counts. So this many trips equals that many successes. Get really good at the art of counter offering, okay? Get really good at rejecting rejection. And so you know, someone called me this week and said, hey look, I think, our, I think we've, we've both reached a point on our relationship where where we're about done. Are you okay with you know, us terminating that? And I said, sure, of course. And then he said, can you help connect us to <laughs> somebody? And I said, hey, Teddy, that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Does it make sense to you? He said, well, no, probably not. I said, well, <laughs> all right, well, let's figure out our role, the three R's, our roles and our relationships and our responsibilities, not our authorities. And I said, so Katie, okay, I'm a little confused because I think you just kind of told me the company wants to let me go, yet you want my assistance. So that I'm not sure the roles are straight right now. Go back and talk to the people that sent you on this and, and, uh, and we're still here to help. So burn no bridges. And then kind of the never quit is, you know, these are business cards. This is about one third. Come on in. This is about one third of the business card. This is about six months business cards. But what I found and with business cards is nine out of 10 people do not send a note back, right? So I gave him a business card. We'll see if he sends me one. Nine out of 10 don't, all right? Those are all missed opportunities, huge missed opportunities. So if, if you exchange business cards or get one that night, first of all, do what I did. So I got Michael Works. Right? And I wrote vibe on the back of it because you're gonna meet people on planes, you're gonna meet them in uh, Starbucks and, and uh, in a, over at the gym, right on the back, because later that night or the next day you're gonna go, who was that? What was that? So, and then send a note back that says, you know, hey, it's, it's great to meet you, look forward, let's, let's get together and uh, real soon. And just cast that one out in the water and then, you know, when one comes back, suspense it a day or two, then cast another one. And then, and then you gotta, you know, you move on opportunity. You have to, all right? The most, many people are, are afraid to fail, right? And so on this one, one of my guys gave this to me. This is the wedge, and uh, he put on there discouragement and encouragement, and, uh, and then he put a line through discouragement. And so you have to encourage yourself to go forward. And then you have to have an encourager who's on your team that's it, that tells you, you know what? And that's the other reason that I kind of went with the hats because there are times when you think, I don't know if we're moving, uh, you know, I don't know if we're moving fast enough. Uh, you know, I, I, and then you go, every one of those is our families who are taking care of our teams of 10 and 15, you know, companies. These guys got together three weeks ago and asked me, Sergeant Major Earl Rice and, and Greg Allen to go to Salt Lake City in order to start a thing called the Veteran Business Alliance. And so there were 30 companies. 
And we took them through the mission and vision and values of what they wanted out of that. And, and, uh, and then what the concept of operation was so that they knew, you know, all units have standards, but great units know them and enforce them. So we 32 companies, we're up to 66 companies. I think we'll be 200 companies by next summer. And they, they absolutely put as number one that they were all, had to be ethical business partners. And so there are five, four or five t-shirt companies all working together in the same sphere. And there's one they won't let in because that guy, you know, when they go to the uh, conferences or trade shows, he always moves his stuff to the best place, you know, and, and cuts the corner on them and all that. And they said, okay, that's fine. We're not, we're not against them, but we're just not gonna spend time with someone that uh, isn't ethical, isn't a team player. And, and then now these guys will do things like, hey, I'm going to Mohegan Sun in, in uh, November 10th, 11th, and 12th, where we're putting on a thing called Vet Rocks. Uh, we're getting 70 uh, Wounded Warriors from uh, Walter Reed, hosting them up there, and then do a, uh, take them up to the Patriots, no offense, Seahawks. <laughs> and then, uh, then we're gonna uh, come back, have a dining in the next day, have a big job fair, and then that night have Tony Orlando do a, a big concert for him. And, uh, but these guys are saying, well, we can all ship our shirts together. So you have four companies figuring out how working together they save costs on shipping. So that's kind of where that is. Um, so do what's right, do your best, improve daily, build teams and take care of the little guy, never quit. And then finally, demonstrate and inspire leadership. And really what that means is as goes you, so goes everything about your company. And if you've got a lemon, you know, sucking on a lemon look on your face all the time, or if you are so much into the management of the day-to-day -day stuff, then you, you're, gonna miss on, you're gonna miss that sparkle in the eye that, that you have, that people walk in and, and see. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, leave some sufficient time for questions and uh, see if I can help in that regard. So I'll open the floor. Brian. Jennifer, can you, uh, the last thing you said was getting too involved in the management. And you, you told a story about um, a soldier coming up to you and saying, hey, sir, I'd like to try something. And, and your response is? Yeah. Yes. If you could elaborate. Well, I, I and it, yeah, it, um, I got to a point where, where not only would, would I be the supervisor of a lot of leaders, but they were the supervisor of a lot of leaders. And so what I tried to teach them was don't overmanage it. And so if someone comes up to you and says, I'm, we're running a rifle range next week, I wanna give you the brief back on the, which is army terms for, I'm gonna describe exactly what we're gonna do in painstaking detail <laughs> so, so that you'll approve it and you'll actually remove the risk off of my shoulders and, um, and you'll buy the risk. Well, if it's at the appropriate level to run the rifle range, then what I would say is don't let them brief you. Teach them to be independent. Teach them to be innovative and creative. Teach them to talk to their team. What's the best way, how are we gonna do this? The boss didn't give us the solution. He refuses to talk to us. We're way out there on a limb. We have to actually be how good we are. And so I would always say, don't have to stop. I don't wanna know. What I wanna know is how it went. And if you wanna do less wrong, just do less. So it's okay, here's what you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to shoot one of our guys. You're not allowed to lose ammunition, all right? Um, that's about it. Everything else, you, you know, in, in some of the larger caliber rounds, you can't shoot it off you know, under the Manhattan City Airport runway, okay? So that's a story I didn't tell. So, <laughs> so other than that, go, go forth with your knowledge, skills, and attributes, and, and innovation, and creativity, and make something special. And then tell me about it so I can learn from you, instead of me always being this uh, vertical down, you know, lack of trust. Um, you know, I want it exactly to look like this, when in fact, more learning goes on when they have to figure it out. So that's, that was that one. Other question? Yes, sir. Oh. Go ahead. Uh, so you, you mentioned being um, a leader of leaders who are also leaders of leaders. So in your uh, progress through that, uh, you know, developing yourself and becoming the person you are today, uh, how, how has that changed? Is it, is it more of the same? Like, did you, did you always have those skills and, and now it just becomes 
a bigger part of your day? Or have, did you have to wake up one day and say, this is the day that I'm the leader of leaders? Or you know, is that a big transition or is it a... Well, you know, this is the question, the question of sort of nature and nurture, right? And so um, nature is um, kind of what's inside of you. Like I said, leadership is who you are. And, and so the, whether you like it or there's no way to, that the way your parents raised you, the way your coaches raised you, that that didn't form you before you came to the military. Um, I think everyone has to make a decision on, am I going to do what's right? And, and some make it a really definitive, boom, this date. And for young officers, a lot of times when someone had an OER and said, you know, you do this or I'm going to give you a bad report. And uh, which occurred to me in, in uh, Alaska in 84, right? And I said, then give me a bad report because I already made a decision I'm not going to ever do anything wrong, you know? And it actually happened in 79 with Captain Smith when I was a lieutenant. Take this truck, go trade all that junk and come back with 700 blankets. I'm like, sir, that's not right. If you're missing blankets, you buy them. And if that's excess, turn it in. <laughs> He's like, Lieutenant Ferrer, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Lieutenant Orr, come over here. Take this truck, you know, trade this stuff. And, and, uh, and he said, sure. So, so the first part is that the whole idea of what your values are. And then the second is winners leave clues, right? So don't be clueless. Winners leave clues. So look around all the time and take the best of every leader that's around you. So, what I, so I would say I, I, probably, I may not be the smartest guy in the room or the best, but I'm around so many guys that are awesome. So I'm just gonna watch the way they act in each of the most challenging, most unexpected, blindsided moments and how, the, how with grace, uh, patience, or firmness, they work their way through it. That, and so that's why I think all of this kind of mentoring stuff is so valuable because you can ask the question you just asked me and you can ask that to a whole bunch of other guys. I, I had a room of uh, army captains about nine months ago. We were on the wrestling mats practicing uh, inspired leadership and uh, headlocks and stuff like that. And during the course of it, I asked them, raise your hand if you've ever been in a toxic leadership environment. Every hand went up. Now raise your hand if you've created a toxic leadership environment. No hands went up. And I said, this is amazing. <laughs> I've got the perfect group of leaders here. Let's put it in a bottle. So we never know, you know, that you can make a person's day, but you can ruin a person's day by a simple, sarcastic, cynical statement or look. And so we want to refine that or continually improve. It fits into that one. Yes, sir. Thanks. Oh, you had a question? I think I, I, you might have answered it, but my, my thing is, you know, I'm the little guy, okay? And it seems like, um, the, you know, the management, they always, they're always worried about themselves and they never take care of the little guy. Mm -hmm. So how does a little guy tell the big guy, I said, you're really messing up, big man. Yeah. I, that's kind of tough. It is tough, but life's tough. You know, it's sort of why we use the, the metaphor of life's a fight and you got to close the distance, establish a dominant position and finish. Um, but there are smart ways. For instance, when I asked one of the Gracie Jiu Jitsu guys, I said, what's your first thought when you're entering in there? He said, don't get hit. So, <laughs> so, so you, the first question is, uh, it, I would, when I would listen to something, I would say, is this immoral or unethical or is it just uncomfortable? And I got a question this past week from someone on, I thought she said racist, but she said abrasive. We were, it was a women empowerment thing we did at JBLM. And she said, I got a boss who's, and she's in the back of the room. I said, whoa, you know, how do you handle that? I said, I'll tell you how you handle it. Come see me afterwards, you know. But so abrasive or selfish. And then, um, so some, so developing techniques, first of all, d determine how you do communicate with them at all. And uh, I used to keep a card in my wallet that said, you know, establish a brief back, um, send an email, do a telephone call, ride in the van with the boss so I can speak to him, run PT with him, you know? And, and when I, cause he was very evasive and, uh, and, and hard to get along with, I was a one star and he was division commander. And so I, you know, the, the, the whole point was never quit. You know, you have to get there. And then sometimes techniques like vote as a block helps out. So uh, at least in the military setting, but probably in many businesses, if two or three of you can go and say, hey, warning order, we'd like to have a lunch or a cup of coffee and talk about some of the inner office things. Some of it has to do with 
this. Just give a taste to them and then a second warning order to kind of get them a little more comfortable. And then as a team say, we're, we're beginning with the end in mind, the output in mind, and we think these things could work. And the answer will be no, or the answer will be yes. But if you don't do it, the answer is no. So that kind of little bit of respect, character, and courage, the courage, you know, what makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage, right? <laughs> yes, yes ma'am, and then I'll come to you. I was late, so if you already talked about this, I'm sorry. Um, but you introduced uh, jujitsu, right, to the army. So I'm curious about um, innovation in a large or a bureaucratic organization. Mm -hmm. What are your suggestions around that? That's a good that? question. Yeah. I think I, that's a, a great question. Um, you first start with. I'm listening to these debates, and I read this book by S.I. Hayakawa a long time ago. And trust me, this guy hadn't read a lot of books, but I read that one, <laughs> and uh, and it was called Logical Fallacies. And so, the, in in that book, he they talk about forestalling disagreement, and you hear it all the time. How can you know? How can you ask me about this when your guy is doing that? That's logic fallacy number one, forestalling disagreement. You know, or are we going to allow all our soldiers to? So in the beginning, I used the, the example of Saving Private Ryan with the little private upstairs and the German sticks the bayonet in them. And, and we said, are we going to allow our soldiers on a battlefield to get a bayonet in their stomach, or are we going to teach them combatives? So that's called forestalling disagreement. But it also created a picture of what we want in the end. So if, if you can articulate the, uh, the value proposition and the goodness of the change you want, then that's good. If it's a technique change, it can, it can happen quickly, and it, it's hard for it to stick. In, in other words, uh, at Fort Benning, um, I noticed that the, the gate guards were, were uh, almost like New Jersey you know, Turnpike or something. They just were not happy. And, and it was a chance to, to make a difference. As we said, everyone that came onto the base that I commanded, I talked to the guys at Disney who were friends of mine, and they said, well, you, you say it's the home of the infantry, it's the home of the paratrooper, it's the home of the ranger. Why don't you have your guards say, welcome home? And so first, you know, the edict came down, all guards went out say, welcome home. And, and it lasted about two weeks, and then I'd come through the gate, and they weren't saying it, and I'd call my sergeant major, and we got into this you have to, you better mode instead of a visionary innovative mode. So then I went down, and I, and I got them all around. And I talked to him, and I said, the reason I think this is important, because we have moms coming back to that cemetery whose kid was killed in it. We have moms from Missouri who've never been here whose kid's out graduating from. So you represent the biggest part of why it's great to serve the nation. And we left there in January of 10, January of 11, 10. And they say it today still. And when I and I drove through there about three weeks ago, and one of the uh, guards said, "Welcome home, sir." And then he smiled. He said, "You're the one that taught me that." <laughs> Isn't that cool? So a big picture, and then it really takes it really takes build build uh, more advocates, and then vote as a block, and then campaign, not a battle. Long time seeking uh, organizational culture change, and inculcating it into their value system that it becomes the normal reflect that action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Leo, anything? Okay, yes, sir. Well, I want to follow up a little bit with Tom's question, sir. Um, so in the military, it's a, it's a culture where really failure is not an option. You don't, you don't give up, you don't do that. But in, in uh, institutions, how do you know when you're not at the top of it, you see your institution doesn't uh, isn't following their own values or your values. How do you know when to quit, or do you change from within? How do you? Where do you make those decisions? And, and Individually, you, personally. Yeah. Well, you got. I got to be true to yourself and to your family, and you know, into your your belief process. So, if if it's amoral, um, you know, then I I'd say you you already know, right? Um, a lot of times. One of the things that we do is leadership training for companies, and, and, and there's an absolute gap 
in the 27 to 35 year olds, there's no training for them. They, they're college grads, therefore they presume, they're business grads, they presume they've been trained in leadership. So we're working in there. But I think there's a big gap at the top too, and, and so we're working with some pretty big companies now. Um, I, I, I think you have to teach and lead up, you know? Um, I think, so, and again, make, make the decision if, if what you believe, what you, you uh, create as a result of, of, you know, the question is what do you do? And you know, my brother said, I'm a Hollywood agent. I said, I said, John, what do you do? He said, I'm a Hollywood agent. I said, no, that's your job. What do you do? What are you doing in this world? And, uh, and so as a result of that position, how does it allow you to do what's really important to you? It could pay the rent and that's all, or it could be a part of the, the given culture. And then make the offer to them. Hey, I think it'd be better and helpful if we did X. And if it's such a big company, um, then I would, well, our daughter works at, at a couple places in uh, Washington DC and you know, we're, we're encouraging her. There are companies that will meet your need in terms of satisfaction and, and being thankful for your service. And you're not at one of them now. And so start looking and, and move out is, is what I would say. Yeah, it's hard, it, you know, it's hard to say, it's easy to say move out, it's hard to say, you know, I gotta let go. So do it, have, so have a plan and then follow it, yeah. Uh, so you have an interesting career path, so military, but now you, you also work in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So you can see the, the differences and similarities in leadership. Um, how does like humility play into the whole thing as far as, you know, you hear about servant leadership and you know, uh, sending the credit out versus bringing it in and, and that sort of thing. So how does that fit in, um, do you see any difference between the military and the private sector in that way? Or how does, how does it work in different organizations and do you need to identify that? Well, as you leave the military or have departed the military and um, you, you uh, felt great satisfaction through service to the nation, service to people, service to the guys on your left and right, your paycheck was guaranteed because, you know, payday comes at the end of the month. So one of the humility things that everyone who's starting a business and the vibe and that kind of thing is you, there is a paycheck and don't be afraid to say I'm worth this much. So that, so a, a counter to probably your question is, first of all, understand yourself enough to know you're not gonna be comfortable saying, I'm worth this much. So talk to these peers and near peers about, well, what do you, what, what do you think the going rate in this market is? And don't be afraid to ask, because otherwise, like Margaret said, after six months, you're really good at charity so far. <laughs> you're good at that charity stuff. Let's try the make money stuff now, right? So that's the first part. And then the second, um, there are great leaders all throughout America. So we don't, we don't have a, a cap on the market. We have more structure in the military on, on, and bringing it to the forefront on corporately, in some cases, holding everyone uh, accountable through Article 15s and court martial or you know, foot march around the airfield kind of stuff. Uh, but there are great leaders everywhere. So you will find uh, humble uh, uh, servants everywhere. And, and I think you should just, um, you, should, you should say, well, when someone says, who is that guy that we hired? And they should say, well, he seems to be quite professional. Um, he asks questions when he doesn't understand things. He doesn't promote himself. Seems to be a pretty good guy. And, I, and then go with it. If, the, if you never get another pay raise, but that's who you are and you like that, then that's good. You know? But you won't, you won't be held back for being a, a quiet uh, professional who's not selfish. In fact, you'll go by. That's my, my belief. I, I'm, I'll learn a little more, but I'm seeing it already. When we put someone, we hire them, we get someone hired um, at what seems to be a low rate, within six months they put their, they're a supervisor and a leader because they're just better trained than the group they joined. And they go zing and buy them. Yeah. But time for one more? Yeah. Uh, you're, in, you're essentially in the change business. Yeah. So uh, change is hard. People resist change. Uh, in the military, I, I imagine you know, there's a certain amount of pressure you can exert, say, change or I'll, I'll, but, I'll push but, back on that. I but even that, even that, we get compliance energy, yeah. you know, which is as long as you're not looking, you never know. Um, how hmm. do you, how do you approach helping people overcome their own resistance? 
Um, so John P. Cotter wrote this book on what leaders do, and then um, A Force for Change. He wrote two books, and uh, he wrote more than that. He's a guy out of Harvard, and they're pretty, pretty good books because I think they're, they're at that. So I read three. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he lists in there, the, you know, the reasons people resist change. You know, one is they don't understand it. Uh, two, it threatens them. Three, um, they don't believe that the change is for the better. And four, um, they're lazy. They, you know, they, he says it in Harvard words, but they're lazy. And so he also offers, you know, how to, you know, um, create the change, lead them to the change. And, and basically, each one kind of matches up, you know, explain to them why we're changing, all right? Um, ensure they understand why it's better. Um, ask them to be a part of it. Somewhere in there, it's either coerce or fire them, right? And so uh, one of my the guys at Fort Benning said, sir, sometimes you have to unencumber their future, right? And so we don't, you don't really want to do that. And, and, and uh, on the other hand, I think you, you want to, you want to get close, you know, kind of get Listerine close and say, look, you know, I know you don't want to say welcome home. I know you just want to get to 1700 and go home. But if someone who raised their right hand in my example and says, I will serve this country, I will support and defend this constitution. Um, and, and they totally buy in and, and we take them from their home to, to basic training, to their family. And everywhere they go, they find, wow, there are people still believe in this. This is really, this is really awesome. And, and I know if I deploy, someone's taking care of me. So you have to create that same sense of, of belief, which is an adherence and a reliance to the, uh, to the thought. And then um, all units have standards and great units enforce them. So then check it, check it, check it. And instead of find, like I said, I wanted to, why won't they say it, Sergeant Major? Then start, you know, the hero of the week, right? And so how did we cut $3 billion out of a budget in two years? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, hero of the week. I'd ask the question, hey, who runs the best child development center in the United States Army? This lady in Ansbach, Germany. Okay, I want her on the worldwide VTC to say what she does and why and who she is. And I want the heads of these other 283 CDCs Child Development Centers, I want them to hear this. How is it that this base saved $40 million on taking trash off of the base? Well, this guy put scales on the forklift and, and weighed the Dempsey dumpsters empty and, and with garbage in it and um, quit paying for moving dumpsters and started paying for moving trash. And so all those kind of innovations, but so, you know, when we're saying, uh, that's a good question, could it, if you go uh, innovation and creativity versus compliance, this will always win, big time. If you, now I talked to Boeing, compliance is probably important in their world, <laughs> you know, with airplanes in the sky, but, but um, if you're talking about really moving the organization, getting this heated up and going, which is why I like the incubator, you know, part of this, this getting going is way more important than, so when I went, they will say, welcome home or else, less said, welcome home. When I said, you're gonna to touch the heart of a woman with blue-gray hair who was stationed here in the 50s and make her feel that her full cycle of life is complete, then they were just good guys. I believe in people. So, yes, sir. Mike, uh, <clears throat> as you well know, the military uh, culture is uh, top down. Mm -hmm. And it appears from what you've said today that your management style is more collaborative, mentoring. Um, I guess I'm wondering how you succeeded in that culture. Uh, coming out of the Citadel, you must have been you know, trained to be militaristic, top down. Yes. And yet, coming out and developing your style, according to your values, along the way, you must have had a, a mentor, mentors that encouraged you and supported you. Hmm. Yeah. Could, could you elaborate on that? How did, how did you evolve into a successful uh, person in a, in a uh, militaristic culture? 
with collaborative management style? Hmm. Um, I think it was evolution. I have a dog tag that says nuclear man, Mike Ferreter, that someone gave me once. <laughs> so I went from nuclear man with a flash to bang, you know, d decision and temper to the guy standing in front of you. Um, I think, uh, um, did you have mentors along I did. The way? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I can name them off. So, Coach Grunewald in Berlin, Germany, little Air Force guy. Right. I was 12 years old, and, you know, he, he said, I said, Coach, you know, he said, Mike, you got to get the ball, you know, basketball. You, you should have had that rebound. I said, Coach, he's holding me. And, and the coach said, Do you want me to go tell the ref that that guy's holding you? And I said, Yeah. And he said, No, <laughs> no, that's not the way it works. You're going to have to fight through some things in life. Now go back out there, boom. And so then, um, coach Downham in uh, at Lake Tahoe, basketball coach. Um, I was with my best friend from Lake Tahoe this past couple of days. He would run this offense. It really was way ahead of, of uh, uh, Jackson, Phil Jackson, you know, uh, swing offense that, that later made Jackson famous. And you would get the ball at 12 to 14 feet, and you'd hear his voice say, that's what we want, just a whisper of encouragement. Maybe that's why I grabbed that wedge earlier that says encourage, discourage. And then Bob Small was a, well, at the Citadel, I had a, a, an Air Force guy named J.T. Tomes. He's a S-hot fighter pilot from Vietnam time. And he would not allow me to write up a classmate. And so he was my TAC officer. But, hey, the guy went over the fence. The guy came back, he drinking. We should, psh, that's a violation of the honor code. Go talk to him. Go talk to him. <laughs> Crazy pills. No, I got the blue book right here. <laughs> You know, no, no, no. And so time after time, then Bob Small was this uh, Army major that, that uh, was a big guy, a little bit overweight. The Army was getting into weight uh, at that point, 1982. He was an incredible leader. And I had a pretty hard job as what we call support platoon leader with a lot of trucks moving all over the place and ammunition and mess halls. And he would just come in and say, you know, how are we doing? You know, what, where's everything? I said, I don't, I don't know where, you know, headquarters 43 is. You know, it's car 54, where are you with those guys? He'd say, okay, well, we'll find them. You know, we haven't lost a truck and a crew in years, so they'll show up. You know, you want to be in control of everything, Mike, but you, you can't, you know. And then uh, uh, Bob Small, when I was a one star, I worked with all the service three stars. So I worked, I was the operations officer at a, at a joint staff as a one star. And I worked with the Marine Corps three star, the Army three-star, Air Force three-star, and the Navy three-star on selecting the troops we were sending to Iraq and Afghanistan. My job was to sign the order. And so I had these three-stars screaming at me all the time. But it's not our turn, it's the Navy's turn. It's not our turn, it's the Air Force turn. And, and General uh, Wood would call me every day at 8.05 and say, hey, did you pick any fights you can't win yet? And I'd say, no, sir, we're, we're, we're good to go still. And so a series of those. Now, you got, I think, um, the winner's leaves clue quote comes in because it's all around us all the time. And so we really want to kind of create the idea in everyone we ever work with that keep your eyes open, there's greatness happening. And, and I was just fortunate to kind of say, wow, that was really smooth the way General Wood helped me. And so then when I got to be a three star, I'd call the one star and say, pick any fights you, you need me to kind of roll in and help you with. And so then you pass it up and pass it down. But there are, my mom and dad are awesome. They were awesome as well. And uh, so I think it was a combination of of all that and a willingness to say, I'm, you know, what's the in order to? So whatever business you're going to run, there's an in order to, you know, in order to sell, you know, hoppy beer in order to sell, um, combat t-shirts in order to interview those that are on their way in order to help those that are in transition out of this, uh, those kind of buildings. And if you keep your focus on the in order to, then the me leaves pretty fast, and then you can be selfless and pointed in what you want to do. May I add something on the speech? But I, one thing that, that you're hanging with Mike all these years is people focus on the boss. Just one person. What about all those people that work for him? I can tell you how many times we've sent flowers to that, to the, the exec, the secretary, Gave a, get, gone back and given a gift to a driver, all the people that help the organization run. If, if you just focus on who's at the top and not all the people that you're dealing with that are in a company that you're working with, not your own company, working with, 
then you're missing humanity, you're missing life. So all those people out there, so Mike doesn't necessarily focus just on the person that he's going to talk to, but he says thank you all along the way, and maybe comes back too and, and reinforces a thank you, because all of them are trying to do the right thing too. Well, that's why I asked the question, because you are in a culture that's contrary to what you have accomplished, and it's quite obvious you've been very successful at it, and it's just amazing to me that you could survive and succeed in a culture that is contrary to what your being is. Yeah. Um, I, I'll give an example. I was in banking before I retired. I had a manager that, uh, an officer, is just retired. I, promote, I, I uh, gave him a job as a manager. He couldn't succeed because all he could do was tell his staff, do this or else, basically. And all the mentoring in the world couldn't do it. And finally, we had to part ways. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, there's a culture in the military that is that way. Mm -hmm. And yet, you succeeded in it and permeated, me, permeated it with your values, and at still the same time, carried out your mission and succeeded on those missions. Yeah. Um. Uh, I, I'm amazed, because <laughs> I've, I've never seen this before. Yeah. And in my experience in the military, uh, yeah, I just didn't like it, and that's why I got out once sure. my yeah. my uh, you know uh, responsibility was done. I think uh, as well, um, you know, I've always told everyone get used to the idea that all I want is fond memories. All right. So when someone gave me a t uh, you know, a hoodie, you know, you visit a unit and they give you a coffee cup, a hoodie, you know, this. I would say first private we see you give this stuff to, because all I want is fond memories. And so, you know, it was the drill. It was, I'd come out, I'd give it to Master Sergeant Nick, who was with me for a number of years, or to the Sergeant Major, and the first guy we saw would say, hey, here's a free t-shirt and coffee mug and such and such. You know, thanks, Sergeant. <laughs> you know, what the hell was that? <laughs> what just happened? You know, but, it, but in the end, um, you know, the, the, the memories are bountiful, the impact, is larger than, than right now would be a storage unit <laughs> that we're living in a rental, you know, full of a bunch of bling that, um, that the other guy deserved anyways. He's probably the one that did the work, you know, that made something magic. Uh, one back there and tell me when we're, we're I, I, got, I got plenty of time, but I, I'm, I value yours. 20 years, and I think you found it 30 something, I presume? 35. Okay, so my question pertains, it ties into his comments there. I completely disagree with him. Now, I also appreciate that we probably have very different, you know, um, situations and mm -hmm. occurrences. So that let me want to ask you: Did you do you find that there was a change in leadership styles from when you came in, what you were taught, and versus what you left with and what you were practicing? Because I kind of, you know, you had 15 years on me, so you came in. You're in a different time period, different core. Uh, leadership and core members mm. from different uh, you know periods of war and things like that, mm. and the, their leaders came from different periods of war, leadership styles, etc. You know, culturally and generationally. Do you would you say that you noticed a change, or was it just were you the change? You know, was that your input, or would you say that the organization, as the military in this case, the army changed? Yeah. Did, did I ask that very well? Yeah, real well. Yeah, that's, that's very fair. So first of all, I uh, I totally respect you know, your experience and, and your view. And, and I grew up in leadership factories. They were called infantry battalions. And they were, it was 99% positive leadership. And, and it was also um, the answer to his question. So as well as all these other things we talk about, I always say to myself, someone else has done this before. You know, come on, this is, can't possibly be the one and only first time. So someone probably figured it out. In all these army units and these military units, the structure allows high schoolers to become command sergeant majors, high schoolers to become three-star generals. And, the, and now it's just a lifelong process, to your point. So the largest transformation in the 90s, there was a whole bunch of talk about transformation and a big T word. And uh, we got a, you know, a lot of hand movement. You know, the hands will never leave the wrists. Watch carefully as I brief you. And um, so we're going to transform the way we do this stuff. Well, the human dimension doesn't change. 
And so high schoolers are as energetic and enthused and uncertain. Well, you do it here. The biggest transition is from high school into college, right? And so the, the boundary setting, the framework, we do it through basic training, PLDC, Primary Leader Development Course, or, uh, Advanced Leader Course, Senior Leader Course. Um, and so each of those is just to catch them at that next waypoint where we already recognize that their relationships have changed. I'm a sergeant, you're still a PFC and a specialist. I'm a staff sergeant, you're, you know, so that they understand their roles and relationship. And in that, you know, you have three levels of leadership, direct and tactical leadership, operational leadership, where most of you, if you're running a company, are gonna be, or you ran in a directorate within the, the college, you have to have a five-year view of life as well as a get-through-this-week view of life. And then strategic leadership, which is, you know, let's, let's change America, so how are we gonna do that, and who, who are the key partners to infuse that, and what are the different avenues with our police force, with our uh, legislatures, local and, and national, with our education system, you know, and then uh, with our businesses. And, you know, so that's kind of a strategic look. And if you spend too much time up there, you'll, you know, you, you'll be horrible. So you gotta get back down to where the action is. So I think developing leaders um, is core business, C-O-R-E, and it's enduring, and the conditions are nuanced. And uh, so my two daughters work for me, and I want, you know, I send them a note, and I want them to call and say, okay, I think I got it, you want this, and you want this, but they'll send me a note. And then I'll be on a plane and I'll do this, I'll do this. And, I'll, and they'll say, I sent you three notes. And I say, okay, well, let's talk about them. Well, I don't have them with me. So, so that's the nuance between generations. But in the end, you know, you, you find the effective communication process and then, um, and then you focus on the end, the mission, and the men and the people taking care of them. So pretty cool. But I agree, I agree with you. We, you know, we were, we were benefactors. So, hundreds and thousands of great leaders. On the other hand, my heart was broken by those that weren't ethical. You know, we lost more generals, you know, to being unethical than being shot in 15 years of war. Uh, that breaks my heart, you know? But everything good they taught me was still good. And then they f they're human and they failed. Yeah, I didn't mean to paint Not at all. Military sure. Black. No, no. There's, there's a lot of gray area. But I guess I'm, just I'm an outlier. I could be called an outlier in that, in that community. I'm just saying, from my experience in the late 60s yeah. in the Army, yeah. it was very different. Yes, perhaps you, the military has evolved to what it is now sure. and what you describe it to be. But I, I'm only speaking of my experience. Yeah. I, I think that the, it's all about the littlest guy. And it's what we're doing now. You know, if, if only Tan had been here today, this would be a huge success for me. You know? And so it's always about, if you take care of them, they will carry you on your shoulders to success in business and in the military. And with that, I think we're done. Thank you. Any more questions? I, I got nothing but time until we run to an airplane. We got about three hours, so. I got one more question. I know you're motivated and you know, the weather's changing and I'm sleeping until 6.30 now. And yeah. How do you sustain your competitive edge? You get up in the morning and you say, hey, this is life, I gotta go with it. I mean, what do you do? Two, two workouts today, I know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I don't know, I just think, I think uh, when I meet, you know, a guy, and I, if he believed in the Army, I want him to believe that the leaders were good. And, and so to that end, it's more about the walk than the talk. And so this morning I said, you know, we're packing, we're getting crazy, we're going down to Monterey, we're coming here. I got off a plane at 11 last night. I said, I, just let me go run three miles, just to get get the, last night's plane out. Um, when any one of us, um, when we see a great leader, we off we should be able to say that's what we expect. And then, if you're a leader, then you should say, um, when I think no one's watching, they're staring. And so, if I'm gonna be in a world where I try to tell them, yes, you can build great teams and be positive, then no matter how tired I am or how busy I am, when you're about to walk by someone, never walk by, if I worked here, I would be saying to the, your faculty, never walk by a student without saying hi. Not once, ever. And if it takes you more time to get to where you're going, leave early, All right? And that's what my, my crew always learned about me is because I was gonna say hi to everyone I, that I saw. 
because I didn't want him to someday say, Tom, hey, granddad, did you ever see a general during Iraq or Afghanistan? Yeah, I saw this guy as a three-star, but it, he must have been busy because he didn't even say a word to me hmm. while I was serving the country. So I, I think that relates into the streets of business as well. And that there's always a drill that we like to do where we say, you know, raise your hand, push one, two, three, or not, don't say push your hand, on the count of three, I want you to go. One, two, three, and then someone pushes against you because it's human nature. And then I always ask, why'd you push? Because you said three. Well, you didn't have to push. I just said three. <laughs> and the same sort of thing is every day people kind of get into that fighting stance. Um, and so we have to train our, our team, that our people, our employees. Don't be surprised when a customer is having a bad day. It's going to be a bad day, a great day, or a medium day. So kind of have a plan, you know. Seems like you're upset. Are you upset with our service or are you just upset? Can I help you at all? Do you want to talk over there? You know, so th what Cotter said in one of those books is train your people. Have them ready for what should come in front of them every single day. So that's, that, that's kind of the way I look at it, a little bit of ramble. we got one more question up here. Okay. So uh, a lot of leadership is norming, and you've described how the military does that. Uh, academic culture is notoriously not top down. So if you were in an academic culture, how would you manage your former self? Nuclear Mike. <laughs> so uh, I'll read back to you what I think I heard you say. So, so I have a colleague or I have a boss. Which is it? We have, I have a colleague. A colleague. Who comes from military culture. Oh. And has, uh, has transitioned into academic culture. Oh, I would, uh, that's easy. <laughs> I would say, you know, I was talking to this general recently and he told me about a guy named General Scott who went to Harvard and screamed at people and then he didn't work at Harvard anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would say, look, I'm, um, I, I mean, one, one of the steps we do in our seminars is I totally respect you and respect your point of view and now I ask you to keep it to yourself. And, uh, and you say, hey, hey, buddy, hey, colleague, hey, friend. You know what? I, I see that you're still ING, transitioning into our team of teams. And I'd, I'd like to have a cup of coffee with you and talk about what's most effective and what's least effective and what's terminal. And say, I, I'm, I don't have a dog in a fight because I'm, I'm not in your chain. But I've seen guys come and totally excel. And I've seen guys, really, and that's instead of leading, they're driving. And... Uh, and they have to, they have to be, be that creative one who can light a fire underneath someone without boiling their blood. You know, get a student motivated without getting them uh, to launch on you. But yeah, I would pull, I'd do a pull side and say, you know, General Frederick told me a story about General Scott. <laughs> <laughs> he lasted two years at, uh, at Harvard. And uh, yeah. Well, thank you, sir. Well, thank you.